All right, I think we can get started. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everyone joining us today. My name is Sandra Sujin Lee, and I'm the Chief of the Division of Ethics and Professor of Medical Humanities uh, and Ethics here at Columbia University. I also have the privilege of leading the Teams resource at the Columbia University Irving Institute for Clinical and Translational Research. This event is a jointly sponsored um, event, and it is the second bioethics in film from screen to seminar event of 2024, which is a division of ethics series that aims to convene a broad audience around films, documentaries, and television to explore critical ethical issues that impact biomedical research and health. As a jointly sponsored event, today is also the second Grand Rounds in Team Science, or GRITS, uh, event for the 23-24 academic year. Our first GRITS was in the fall uh, with Dr. Betsy Rowland, who spoke on the impact of academic culture on interdisciplinary collaboration. In today's session, we will continue our exploration of academic culture and institutional practice by focusing on key questions of equity and the professional development of women in science. We are thrilled to be able to engage four amazing women for this discussion and to highlight brilliant works produced by two of our panelists. The first is the book, The Exceptions, published by Scribner in 2023 by Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Kate Zernicki, and the documentary Picture a Scientist, director and, uh, directed and produced by Sharon Shattuck. These works provide a rich, nuanced look into the lives of women scientists and how their trajectories have been shaped by the social cultural beliefs and practices in major research universities. To help us explore the insights and issues raised in the exceptions and picture a scientist, we're very fortunate to have faculty members Gisette Reyes Soffer and Mimi Shirazu Hiza here for this dialogue. Uh, but before I turn to doing proper introductions of our speakers, I wanted to go over some housekeeping uh, items. So first, uh, we're asking that all attendees please abide by the code of conduct, uh, which is described in the link um, that can be found in the chat. We have a live closed captioner present for this event. If you wish to use closed captioning, please turn on the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we are fortunate to have uh, many of you with us uh, today, both at Columbia and outside, and we ask you that you please uh, submit your questions for the panelists in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You can register your enthusiasm for a question and elevate it up the list by using the upvote button in the Q&A box. Uh, the chat is available for further engagement, uh, and you are welcome to drop comments and resources there uh, to share with others. Um, if you have any logistical problems uh, or questions, please do email us at mhe underscore ethics at cumccolumbia.edu at any time. Okay, so now it is my pleasure uh, to give you a more detailed introduction to our four panelists. Uh, the first, um, Kate Zernicki, is a national correspondent for the New York Times, where she writes about abortion in the post-Roe uh, era. She has been a reporter at the Times since 2000 and was a member of the team that won the 2002 Pulitzer Prize for explanatory reporting for stories about al-Qaeda before and after the 9-11 terror attacks. She was previously a reporter for the Boston Globe, where she broke the story of MIT's admission that it had discriminated against women on its faculty, uh, on which the book highlighted for this session, uh, entitled The Exceptions, Nancy Hopkins and the Fight for Women in Science, is based. Uh, she is the daughter and granddaughter of scientists. She is a graduate of Trinity College at the University of Toronto and the Graduate School of Journalism at our own Columbia uh, University. Uh, she lives in New Jersey and uh, with her husband and sons. Sharon Shattuck is a documentary filmmaker and podcast host. Her film, Picture a Scientist, was nominated for a 2022 News and Documentary Emmy Award and was distributed on Netflix and PBS Nova. Other works um, by uh, Sharon is uh, From This Day Forward, which was a New York Times critics pick 
and her Emmy-nominated science short film series, Animated Life, which is available on the New York Times OpDocs. She's the co-host of the podcast Conviction, American Panic on Spotify. Uh, the subject of the show was exonerated in 2023, due in part uh, to their reporting. Sharon has degrees in forest ecology and biology from the University of Michigan and a graduate degree in journalism from NYU. She lives in Brooklyn with her husband and toddler. Uh, our third panelist uh, is a member of our own faculty, Mimi Shirazu Hiza, um, who is a professor of genetics and development at CUIMC. She received her PhD in biology from the University of California, San Francisco, uh, completing her doctoral research in the lab of Timothy Mitchison. She was then a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford University in David Schneider's lab. Dr. Shirazu Hisa's uh, lab currently aims to understand how specific circadian uh, regulated physiological functions contribute to health and disease using Drosophila melanogaster. Uh, uh, the lab's overarching goal is to use circadian uh, biology as a prism to understand the interaction, coordination, and regulation of complex physiologies in the whole animal that contribute to disease pathology. Dr. Shiriza, Hiza, um, Shiri, um, Shirazu Hiza's lab specifically focuses on innate immune cell function, metabolism, and sleep. As a director of the genetics uh, graduate program, Dr. Shirazu Hiza uh, is, is deeply interested in identifying best practices for graduate student mentorship and training, as well as understanding how to create diverse, equitable, and inclusive uh, scientific environments. And finally, we have Dr. Gisette uh, reyes Soffer, who is an assistant professor of medicine in the Department of Medicine, Division of Preventive Medicine and Nutrition at CUIMC. She is an NIH, American Health Association, and industry-funded mid-career investigator examining the metabolic pathways that regulate lipid and lipoprotein metabolism in humans. Her work has been published in numerous journals, including the Journal of Clinical Investigation, Science and Translational Medicine, and Circulation. She is a co-founder of a local academic peer mentoring initiative, CTS supported called Accountability, Accountability and Safe Space to Promote, Inspire, Recharge, and Empower, hence uh, the acronym ASPIRE, exclamation mark, and has mentored numerous uh, trainees from uh, through her volunteer and leadership roles within the H AHA Arteriosclerosis Thrombosis and Vascular Biology Council. She is a member of the North American Vascular Biology Organization and the American College of, Cardi uh, American College of Cardiology. She is also on the Scientific Advisory Board for the National Lipid Association and member of the Programming Board for the American Diabetes Association scientific sessions. She is a standing member of the NIH National Heart, Lung and Blood Institute mentored patient oriented research study section and serves on the scientific board of the Family Heart Foundation and the LPA uh, forum. So as you can see here, uh, we have uh, three, uh, five, four incredible women who have agreed to engage us in the focus of today's discussion, uh, which is going to be on equity in biomedical research. Now, um, there are numerous studies uh, in the science of team science literature that have documented that the equitable representation of women is critical for the development process and outcomes of scientific teams. In a 2021 NSF report, it was noted that among people between the ages of 18 and 74, women make up about a third of people employed in STEM occupations. This um, is not just a US disparity, but a global one. In an article written uh, for the United Nations by Shamila Nair Boudel, uh, the Assistant Director General uh, for Natural Sciences at UNESCO, uh, she wrote in her recent article, The Lack of Gender Equality in Science is Everyone's Problem, in which she argues that gender inequity is impeding economic growth and development uh, worldwide. She points out important facts that female researchers tend to have shorter, well less paid careers. Their work is underrepresented in high profile journals. They are often passed over for promotion. 
Women are typically given smaller research grants than their male colleagues and earn less recognition from their peers with only 12% of members of national science academies identifying as women. So we're gonna explore why this is uh, in the, the next uh, hour and a half that we have together. Um, we're going to try to understand why these uh, inequities um, and the practices that lead to these outcomes are often rendered invisible and what can be done both on the part of individuals, but also institutions like ourselves, our, our own, um, what can be done in terms of creating change. So um, I wanna turn to the panelists and um, I think, are we all good with, um, I should have asked you before we began, are we all good with first names uh, as a way of address? Okay, great, yes. So Kate, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with you. First of all, I want to congratulate you um, on your book. Uh, your book beautifully details uh, the lives of women who you call exceptions, and I, I do want you to explain um, the title, if you will. But could you just start by describing, you know, the book and why you wrote it, and and maybe um, if you want to read an excerpt, um, that would be terrific. Actually, just yeah, to... sure. Well, thank you for having me, and I'm I'm excited to be here today. Um, and Sharon, I should say, I was at a, I did another event last night, and I saw the film. Um, I think it's actually the K through 12 academic version of the film, but I will say that every time, you know, I wrote this story, I broke the story about these women at MIT who really started this revolution for women in science in 1999. And yet, and I've seen the film before and I've obviously written this book. And yet every time I hear the story, I find it incredibly stirring and motivating. So um, I hope everyone else will emerge from the discussion today with the same feeling. I, um, as I say, I was a reporter in 1999 and I got this tip. I was a reporter at the Boston Globe and I got a tip that there was something going on with women and discrimination at MIT. And so I was given the name of this woman, Nancy Hopkins. My father, as you said, had been a scientist and had talked to me about the lack of women in science. So I knew that, you know, this was, there was something here, but I wasn't prepared for what I found, which was that when I called Nancy Hopkins, she told me that in fact, MIT was going to acknowledge the president of MIT was going to admit that the university had discriminated against women on its faculty, which really was a striking, a strikingly brave and bold thing to do, especially in 1999. I think none of us were expecting that. And then she talked to me about how, um, how this had happened because these women had, because the group of women at the School of Science at MIT had come together and gathered their data to prove their case, which I thought was like a wonderful testament to science itself. These women had really leaned into their passion for science to make their case about discrimination. And they were talking about a new kind of discrimination, which wasn't the traditional, you know, what I thought of discrimination, which was the door had been closed to women, right? Like, from my perspective, I was about 30 at the time, the door had been opened. And what they they taught me, and I think taught the world and, and affirmed for many women in science in particular, was that it's not just about opening doors for women, it's about how you treat women over the course of their careers. Um, so they talked about it in, they used the word unconscious bias, which was a new term at that point. By the time I came back to writing the book, and I started in 2018, um, you know, the term unconscious bias was so familiar um, that many people, I think, discount or continue to discount that it's real or they think it's an excess of wokeism. So the challenge and the opportunity of the book was really to describe to people how it happens. And again, how it's, it really is a small accumulation of slights over a career that can cause so much damage. Um, and so I was lucky enough to have Nancy Hopkins as my protagonist and to have her be willing to tell to talk to me about like how to tell the story of how this had happened to her over the course of her career. So just to set up the discussion, because MIT really, you know, when MIT did this in 1999, it did kick off a discussion. It led to many of the reports, including the report that you're talking about, much more discussion of women in science. So I'm just going to read the first paragraph of the book, which sets the stage. In March of 1999, a story above the fold on the front page of the Boston Sunday Globe reported that the Massachusetts Institute of Technology had acknowledged longstanding discrimination against women on its science faculty. It was, quote, an extraordinary admission as an article on the front page of the New York Times called it two days later, by which point the news had traveled around the world by radio, television, and a fever pitch at emails between female, female scientists who had long known they were not valued as highly as men, but talked about it only among themselves, if at all. Here was one of the most prestigious institutions in the world, synonymous with scientific excellence. The discrimination had happened not in some, some dark age, but in the 1990s, the dawn of a new millennium, decades after legislation and the women's movement had pushed open the doors of opportunity. Most women starting their careers at the time did not think bias, bias would block them. Women who complained of discrimination typically ended up in the deadlock of he said, she said. 
Now the president of MIT was saying it was true. That admission came about not because of a lawsuit or formal complaint, but because of the work of 16 women who had started as strangers working in secret and gathered their case so methodically, like the scientists they were, that MIT could not ignore them. They upset the usual assumptions about why there were so few women in science and math and unleashed a reckoning across the United States as are the other universities, philanthropies and government agencies rushed to address the bias and the disparities that had disadvantaged women for decades. Quote, a climate change and the whole of academia as an astronomer at the California Institute of Technology called it. So anyway, look right. forward to the discussion. Yeah, no, thank you. That was um, a great way to open. Uh, Sharon, I, I want to go to you next. Um, I have to say that I have been um, using your film in various classes for the last few years, and it's it's always very powerful, and, and it really catalyzes great discussion. Um, I'm wondering if you could also just introduce folks who maybe haven't had a chance to see it. I, I do want to make sure that the audience know that, um, that we do have a link to the film available to you all um, in case you haven't seen it yet. But um, Sharon, if you could um, take a moment just to orient folks to, to your piece, that would be great. Sure. Um, I, thank you so much for having me. It's really a pleasure to be here um, and among such amazing company. Um, so picture scientists. So the film started out like it was around 2018 when we were talking with somebody at um, at the MIT press, actually, and, and they had said, hey, you should really you should look into the story about Nancy Hopkins and the women that she was with at MIT. And so one of the first things we did is we found Kate's articles with the Boston Globe and and we were just uh, struck by this amazing story. And we started talking with Nancy and she's just the most inspiring, pleasant, like such a great person to talk to. Um, so that's where we we first were like, okay, maybe we make the story about the MIT story. You know, maybe that's our film. Um, but then we were like, you know, things have improved. Obviously, over the you know, they they the women at MIT improved um, things for women in science a lot uh, through their work. But it's not, you know, we know that it's, we're not done. <laughs> like there's still work to be done. And so where we decided to go from there was to. Um, to look at other stories to try to bring into the film so that it wasn't just the MIT story, so that that was one of, of three different threads, um, along with unconscious bias, which is like its own kind of fourth pod of the movie. And we really wanted to, to broaden the perspective and, and talk about, we, in the film, we talk about this iceberg analogy, um, which this NAS report uses where it's like the, the tip of the iceberg are these really overt sexual harassment, um, events and then under the iceberg there's just a lot more of this insidious these little everyday slights and and how those can add up over the course of somebody's career into um causing somebody to leave science and so that's what we really wanted to do in the film is to bring points from around this iceberg and try to show uh the different perspectives of women in science and and also people of color in science so that was really our our hope um yeah, so that's that's kind of what ended up becoming Picture a Scientist. Yeah, that's and great. Do we, do we have? A, should I show a clip now? Or yeah, we... you know we do have the clip. I think teed up. If that if that would be um, good to show now, that would be great. Do you want to say anything about the clip? Yeah, I, I guess I should say before. So one thing that we thought about with the movie was we wanted it to be um, about both data and people's stories, you know, um, because these anecdotal stories aren't so anecdotal when you look at them in the aggregate and you realize that there is a pattern here and there's a real, um, it's not just, you know, people who had inf incidences of bad luck. It's, it's like together you see it as a pattern and you see the data. And so in this clip, um, it's really Nancy Hopkins visits her friend, um, Dr. Mazarin Banaji, who studies unconscious bias and they just have a conversation but i think it's a really for us i think tonight or today i think it'll be really um poignant and interesting great all right and i just uh, i think the volume isn't on Um, 
recently somebody had shown me an email they'd received from a very distinguished scientist who happens to be a colleague of mine. So I was particularly upset by it, saying that he had looked very carefully and he'd seen no bias or prejudice against women during his entire career. And therefore he was confident that such thing did not exist. And I guess, you know, at this point in time, 2019, this email was a few months ago, I just was shocked by this. These are great scientists. How can they not know this? How can they not believe this? If they know it, don't they believe it? This worries me a lot. So when I hear stories like the one you tell that your male colleague believes that he's never seen it, I have two kinds of responses to it. One, I understand that he may be truly unaware and genuinely believing that he's looking for it and just not seeing it. It's in the nature of this beast that we're trying to identify. It's invisible. Um, but then I also feel that he has no business saying what he did because today the evidence is so much more clear that he need not rely on his own personal experience. He just needs to look at the data. That's what he'd want us to do for his science. He'd say, Mazarin, whatever you may think about turbulence or whatever, that doesn't matter. That's your um, intuitive experience of the physical world. But you need to know the research. And I would say the same to him because the time has passed now for saying, I don't see it anywhere. And that's why we should be concerned that anybody who says it's not happening or not happening anymore is just made to retract those words because <laughs> they can say, I, I'm not going to change my behavior. I don't care about it. All of that. That's their opinion. But they cannot say that the evidence doesn't exist. That's such an interesting clip. And I guess I, you know, I'm, I'm heartened that uh, evidence actually, I think what's being suggested there is that we need more evidence. And when faced with evidence that might promote change, I, is that, is, does that resonate? Uh, Kate, I mean, I, I would love your thoughts on, on that. Um, is that true? Is that why you're seeing more and more discussion and, and perhaps a reflection on, on the inequities uh, that women face in science because of the evidence? I'm muting. Um, yeah, I mean, I think this is why the MIT story did resonate. It's this The MIT report, the MIT story, this admission by MIT came around because, as I said, the, the women had produced this report about the disparities, but there had been many, many reports from many different institutions, science faculties and otherwise, you know, Harvard was doing one every year, Johns Hopkins had done one the year before. This was not a problem that no one had documented. What was so different about the MIT report were really two things. One was that the women really had leaned into the data um, and two was the president's admission. But when I went to meet with Nancy Hopkins in her office, when I first heard about the story, I said to her, you know, how did this whole thing start? And she said, well, you know, I needed more space for my fish tanks. Um, I, you know, she works researching zebrafish and I tried to get more space, but it, they wouldn't give it to me. And even though I knew the men had more space than I did, and I said, well, how did you know that? And she said, well, I measured. And I was like, you measured? And she said, yeah, with a tape measure, like it was the most obvious thing in the world. And to her, it was right the, to her. It was go straight to the data. What do the numbers tell us? But that tape measure became the lead of my story. And really, as I say in the book and the exceptions, you know, it, it kind of, it, it symbolized for women. It gave women a way to think about what they knew had been happening to them. They sort of intuited this had been happening to them. And they were like, oh yes, here, someone, someone has given me a way to, to measure this, to express it. Like that tape measure is now in the MIT museum, which is a fact I love because I do think it became emblematic of this shift to where we were talking about the very real concrete ways in which this happens. Mm. Yeah, that's so interesting. I mean, it really came down to sh comparing square footage, right? Uh, right. You know, right. to show the inequities. Um, so I I want to invite Mimi and Gisette, um into the conversation, and and maybe we could start, Mimi, if if you could um, just tell us a little bit about your own journey uh, as a scientist, um, and and how um, these two works um, resonate or not resonate with with the, what you've experienced along the way. Well, first, I, I think actually I want to say we screened the show, the movie. It's interesting that you chose that clip um, because we screen, actually screened this movie, um, this film, 
a couple of years ago during the pandemic, uh, the neuro program did. Um, and I was trying to get people to go see it. And I announced it at a, I don't know, I think it was a town hall or a maybe it was a symposium of some kind of retreat. Anyway, so I want I told the students that they should see it. And then during the break, which was on Zoom, so it's fairly public, I, I did get pushback from from one of my male colleagues who whom I actually enjoy very much and I completely respect and, and like him, but it was almost exactly the same conversation <laughs> where he was like, you know, but this doesn't really exist anymore. Like, why are you showing this film now? <laughs> you know, And there was a lot of, um, you know, discussion in the break where I was like, you know, I, I'm not super comfortable like representing all women, but, um, <laughs> but actually, I, I can say that this this does exist and that there is data and that, you know, it, we don't understand exactly how it affects every single person. But there are, you know, obviously there are assumptions um, and differences in treatment for women and men. And But he would he refuse to believe it, actually, because, you know, he's a scientist and for him... And he, also, he has a wife who's a scientist, and he was like, "My wife has never experienced anything like this, so obviously, it does not exist." You know, so like, lucky for her, <laughs> you know. I think so. I can say for me, right? I'm, I don't want to represent anybody else. Um, for for me, I would say, you know, it, I the ways that I have experienced um, discrimination are are sort of just sort of bound up in not just being female, but being very small, for example, and Asian. And, you know, I mean, there are lots of ways that people um, can dismiss, um, you know, people who are are different from the typical scientist um, and not respect people or, or question their expertise or their knowledge or their... Um, you know, their interpretation of data, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, that's that's a kind of thing that I think is so routine for women <laughs> that we don't even necessarily see it as discrimination or bias. Um, but you know, it's a it's a particularly insidious, I think, systemic bias. And then, you know, uh, I think for me, you know, much of graduate school and and postdoc, I didn't really feel as though I was you know, biased against, but it wasn't until I had children that I realized, oh, crap, I am biologically different <laughs> from my male colleagues. Um, and experience, I'm experiencing this journey very differently than my male colleagues. So I think, you know, having children is, is one really obvious discriminator and um, something that, you know, isn't, it's, my colleague was saying, for example, like, you know, I, I'm not biased. And it's 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 true. I'm, most of the scientists that I know, male or female, are not intentionally biased, right? Like nobody's trying to oppress me <laughs> necessarily, right? But it, it, it there are sort of systemic and institutional um sort of the ways that we do things and the ways that science operates, you know, for example, demanding that 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 you have a body of work and a, a sort of um, uh, establish yourself at a time that is your childbearing fertile years. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's it's just, that's not anybody's fault, but that is a systemic problem if we really think that um, you know having women in science in their later years is a is a good idea, which you know I think it is. Um, and the other way that I've I, I would say this sort of really strong way is it's not so much um, the way that people, you know, again, like oppress me or anything, but it's more just like the assumptions that people make about how I should act, right? Especially as a boss or a PI, right? Um, you know, you hear this all the time, but it's really true. Like if a if you if if I as a as a boss say something to a student or a colleague or or facilities <laughs> or you know uh the the security guard downstairs so, something that i say that is unexpected for sort of socialized acceptable female behavior i i get labeled a bitch <laughs> you know that, that doesn't happen to my male colleagues right um you know just different 
assumptions about um, how I should act toward other people um, and what that means about my character or my my fitness as a boss or a scientist. Um, there are just very different rules applied to men and women. And that's, again, a systemic problem. Um, so I guess that's how I would say I experience, you know, this film is like seeing it and just being like, wow, yeah, that's exactly right. Um, it is an iceberg and so much of it is invisible. Hmm. Thank you. Yeah, I want to I want to dig into some of the social norms that you that you're alluding to. Um, but before we do that, Gisette, I want I want to bring you into the conversation and and ask you the same question, just in terms of, um, you know, your uh, career development and and being here at Columbia um, and also how how you re reflected on the, the film and or book. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much for having me. And I just want to start by thanking um, Kate and Sharon for lifting our voices and, you know, amplifying, because I think amplification of the problems are key to us getting change. I think, um, as you all said, when you were writing these, there was each institution had a problem, but unless you highlight one of them, the other ones won't come out. So I think that is key to us sort of achieving some type of recognition that this exists and maybe in the future equity. I share Mimi's, you know, we're at the same institution. So I think um, I don't want to speak for her, but I myself, I would say the first thing that you feel as a woman scientist working at Columbia University is that you're privileged, right? So it is just like those women, it was a privilege to be given an opportunity to do your science at a top institution. And so that opportunity comes with some pain. Um, and so the pain is not something that we can't handle, obviously, because we're here, we're happy, and we're productive. But um, it comes, I don't think for me, it's been hidden. I am a foreign medical graduate. So I had a very thick accent when I arrived at Columbia 20 years ago. And so there was a language issue. There was also a systems issue, like knowing when to speak, when not to speak. Um, most of the people in power at the time I came, and I think Dean, um, Dean Taylor came two years after my postdoc started. And so most of the people in power at that time were probably many males um, and not um, in the department that I'm in, which is the Department of Medicine, definitely not a lot of tenure female faculty and that has changed over time. And so what I can say is that despite the microaggressions and the macroaggressions at times, um, I don't wanna use the word resilience because it's not a good word and I hate when people, um, in my recommendation letters, people always write, she's res violent. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm smart. <laughs> and my science is great. And I learned quickly and it was a steep hill and I climbed it. But that's not, you know, people who are males um, describe you differently. They see it as, oh, she was given an opportunity. She was given a chance, but they never highlight, um, well, she was really smart because other people that had really, really good training are here and she's hanging out with them and she's keeping up with them. So I think that's some of the differences that I've seen. Um, I also have a really, really strong self-esteem and I had a really strong family support. And so the fact that I haven't had any other social sort of crises arose during this time has allowed me to take on some of that and not, you know, fail. Because I think that that's what happens, right? You not only have this, but then you have your child is sick, uh, you don't get married, um, you got dumped by your husband or like, you know, many other things that like happen in life then women really uh, track off. Um, I have an interesting story that happened recently just so because I think when we were planning this, we said, well, how is it different now than when you guys wrote the book or the film? And so I was at a thesis meeting, um, a thesis committee meeting where for those on the call, I think maybe they're physicians and stuff, so there's three faculty members and there's a PI, uh, the head of the lab with their student. And we're having our, our talk without the student in the room. And one of the senior members, the most senior member uh, in the team, we I said, well, maybe the candidate has a little imposter syndrome, which is common, right? And um, underrepresented minorities and things like this. And I, the senior member did not know what imposter syndrome was. And so, um, you know, so we had this conversation and what I was shocked about was that 
what his definition of imposter syndrome was. He thought it was about like coming from a socioeconomic studies that wasn't um, as good as other people that they struggled to get where they were. And I was like, well, actually in this sense, I wasn't really mentioning that. Um, I think this person is very well qualified to do this PhD thesis. I think she just doesn't feel empowered to do it. And so very different than what they thought the definition was. And I think that that just highlights to you that despite all the training we have, all the conversations we have, everything that our PhD programs are doing, I think we need to do more and we need to do better. And so that's um, one example of like a quick, you know, sort of story that I think. Yeah, yeah. no, that speaks volumes. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, I'm wondering, um, it, it seems to me that um, relationship building is so key to one's um, career development. And just in terms of, I mean, we all know about the old boys club or that kind of added, what does that mean? Um, it seems to me that networks were really important in the stories, um, Kate, that you were, you're telling and Sharon, you also, um, both in terms of um, presenting challenges, but also overcoming them. And I'm just wondering if you could share with us a little bit about the importance of networks and relationships. Yeah. So, um, so when we meet, first meet Nancy Hopkins in the book, and the, the, as I said, the, this is a story of women coming together, but it really is, it's told through Nancy's whole experience. And when we first meet her, she's a 19 year old junior at Radcliffe, which was the girls version of Harvard. And they did call them girls. Um, and it's 1963. And she is in a lecture by James Watson, who um, has just been awarded with Francis Crick, the Nobel Prize for decoding the structure of DNA. And Watson becomes Nancy's mentor, which is incredibly important to her because he knows everyone. It's a very small field at the time, and he's kind of the leader or a leader of it. And so having, first of all, she got excellent training, but also just sort of being in Jim's orbit was really important to her. When she goes to MIT, she gets her PhD she goes to MIT to start working in the new cancer center there. And she doesn't really have a Jim Watson figure or someone who is a mentor to her in that way. Um, but what's so interesting to me is when Nancy does, you know, these women, there were in 1994, when these women started their work, there were 15 women with tenure at the School of Science at MIT, at MIT and 197 men. So just think of that disparity. It's incredible in 1994. And the women were really scattered all over the different um, departments of the School of Science. So they didn't, and, and if they were in the same department, they often didn't work in the same buildings. So that, as I often say, they had no control group, right? Like they had no one with whom to compare their experience. Once Nancy first meets one, you know, first talk, you know, sort of gradually talks, it gets the courage to talk about the issue with one woman because she's really at her wit's end. She's like, I'm going to leave science if I can't do something about this. She talks to one woman and in, the woman says, yes, I, I see this problem too. And in that moment, there's such power just having one ally. And then she goes and they discover together that they actually have, you know, that there's a, six, a group of 16 of them. And that really, not only does it give them a sense of power, but it also allows them to go make their case more effectively. And there's this wonderful, you know, to me, again, very move, moving moment in the book where, um, the women, um, first Nancy thinks she's going to write a letter to the president of MIT and tell him all the problems. And then they decide they're not going to do that. They're going to go through the normal chain of command and they're going to write a letter to the dean of science. And they spend all summer writing this letter, like making their case very carefully. And they're really worried. They make a meet, they set up a meeting with him and they go meet him and they're very worried. They're like, oh my God, the university must have called lawyers and we're going to be in trouble. And they go to him and like the dean hasn't read their letter. He doesn't know why they're there. But there are six of the women and they're sitting around his conference table and he hears their stories one after another. And he recognizes like scientists do that, or like journalists do really, that this is a pattern. Had any one of those women come to him on her own, he would have mm -hmm. said, and this is one of the reasons I call the book, The Exceptions, he would have explained her story as he knew all these women. He was like, oh, that's this circumstance or that circumstance. She's the exception, not the rule. But when you see these women, when you hear their stories, you know, one after the other, he realizes it is, in fact, the pattern, it is the rule, and he describes it as a real epiphany, you know, like an epiphany that he's had in his scientific work, he's a physicist. So I do think that this is, it's incredibly important to Nancy to have that network. And I would also say, like, that's kind of been the lesson to me coming out of writing the book, because I spent so much time um, 
I was when I when I started reporting the book, I was I was covering women in politics. I was doing a beat about women in politics. So I spent 2018 doing that beat and also reporting the starting to report this book. And then I spent three years writing the book. And then since 2020, I've um, been reporting on abortion. So it means I talk to women all day. And it's kind of the first time in my professional life that that's true. And it has really been life changing for me because I do feel like I have this great network with me just kind of backing me up. Mm, interesting. Um, Sharon, did you find the same when you were putting the film together? Or yeah, I mean, obviously the MIT story was just incredible and being able to see those women, you know, come together. Like we, one of the first things we filmed actually was a meeting that they had that, that was celebrating the anniversary of this, this group of women. And so we, they all came together, we got to meet them in person. Um, and we did all these interviews back to back and that's when we first met Nancy and, and it was just kind of, it's funny in the movie, it's like, it comes later in the film, but like in real life, it was the first thing we shot. Um, but just seeing them all together is really, it was just, it's so heartwarming to see how they complement one another and how, you know, the pieces fit together. And, um, yeah, it, it was, uh, I've taken a lot from filming with them and, um, and, but the other stories too are about. The, we, we feature a woman named Jane Willenbring, who was um, the student of a geologist named David Marchant, who worked in Antarctica, and um, she was she went on a, a summer field research um, the summer or winter, anyway, you know, it's different down there because of the seasons, but um, they they were there for a full season, like isolated from everybody else, and she only had a field assistant and another student named Adam there. and. Um, and she didn't talk to anybody about her experience, but he was just constantly abusing her, you know, just emotionally, um, sometimes physically, like pushing her down a mountain. Um, and she didn't talk about it and she didn't talk about it for a long time until she was pushed to decide to file a Title IX complaint. And that's when um, she reached out to Adam and he had seen the whole thing and he, he felt like, oh, you know, you're so strong, like you you know, you, you were fine. Like, I didn't think I needed to help. And, and it wasn't until she started talking and saying, actually, I really would have liked to talk to you about this. And I, you know, and so I think for her, it was a moment of like, oh, I, sh I wish I would have said something, but also he should have said something. And, and it was, we were able to capture that discussion on camera. Um, and then uh, ultimately what happened is in her title nine, we started filming, they hadn't actually made a decision about this professor. So the um, Boston University, this panel had been debating what to do about David Marchant and um, they actually had recommended that he don't, he shouldn't face disciplinary action and that he was going to just return to being a professor. And that's where, when we were filming with Jane, that's kind of where things stood. And it wasn't until after we finished filming with her that we found out that um, the president of Boston University, uh, Bob Brown, who was previously at MIT and friends with Nancy Hopkins, decided to fire him. And so it, it was really like, and that came because of Adam's letter and because of this anonymous woman's letter, who was also a student of David Marchand. It was, it was people coming together and saying, these are my experiences and this person, this is a pattern again. Um, so yeah, I, th I found it like in, like I think some people will say, "Oh, picture scientist is kind of depressing because you you know you're bringing to light these stories and how frustrating and you know for a young scientist starting out to to be confronted with this reality." But I've always felt like, well, I don't know. I I, I think that on the balance, the like camaraderie and the the being able to talk about these things um, and find a community and find your support, like the way Rachel Burks, our our chemist found her people, you know, and she's be, she's found this amazing network that she's created online. And, you know, she went from feeling like an outsider to being a total rock star in chemistry. Um, anyway, yeah, that's, I think, um, I hope that people take away some hope from the film too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, Kate, you un unmuted. Did you want to jump in there? Yeah, I was just going to say, I mean, it's not, it's not for nothing that the president of BU, of Boston University, who did this was Bob Brown, who had been um, provost at MIT. And, you know, Bob Brown was an engineer and he's steeped in this very male engineer culture, but he too was enlightened to this problem by these women. So there's just so many different ways in this story that Sharon and I both tell in which networks are important. Like, so one of the things is, yes, like there were actually five, five men, oh, I think it's five men, maybe four, who were at MIT at the time and really were convinced by this case that the women made 
and went on to lead other universities. So, um, so I think, and, and, you know, became advocates for this. So I think like there's, yes, networks matter in, in many different ways. That's what, that was mm -hmm. the only point I was going to make. Yeah. I, I want to turn to Mimi and, and just, uh, just to ask you about your experience with networks, but also, you know, you, you both mentor, you're both running mentorship programs. So I am curious what your advice is to, to uh, junior um, faculty members, trainees who are women. Um, but I also want to encourage the audience. I mean, we have, um, uh, you know, about a hundred people in the Zoom room and would love to to hear what your questions are and, and to the extent that you want to share your experiences when you ask your questions, that would be great. So please do put those in the Q&A and, and I'm going to try to get to as many as possible. Um, but, you know, Mimi and Gisette, um, maybe Mimi, I'll go to your, you first. Um, you know, I, I personally too have really benefited from um, having these relationships with with women who are uh, more senior to me, um, and just even having one or two people who you you know are they create a safe space where you can talk about things you're just not sure about. Did I read that situation correctly? Those kinds of things. I'm just wondering what you what you recommend or and in your mentorship programs uh, for for people who are coming down the pike. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of like peer mentoring groups, actually, I'm in like three or four at any one time myself, you know, just different, different kinds of groups. I mean, I think, you know, the, the, the research is clear at this point, you know, that, that really having one mentor is not enough, right? Everybody should have a network of mentors, right? And that includes people who are near peer or peers, um, people who are close to your own experience. And part of that is like, just sharing experiences and solutions and strategies, um, that's huge. But also part of it is just having a sense of belonging, right? And feeling like, you know, when you, when you were talking about um, imposter syndrome, <laughs> she said, I was like, yes, exactly. I think all, almost every woman I know has a feeling of, you know, is is has imposter syndrome. And so, you know, the cure for that is to, to, in terms of like feeling like you belong is to create the space where you belong, right? With people that you have things in common with. And, um, and for me, that was huge in terms of my confidence and also just giving me, um, yeah, is it expands the strategies and solutions that you can come up with and also just gives you you know, in terms of collaborations and science, I mean, all science is very collaborative these days. So, you know, it's, it actually is, um, it always has been, is a thing, right? But the, the networks did not traditionally include um, many of, many of us, right? So having a, an alternative network, the old girls network, <laughs> or the new girls network, whichever, whichever one, right, is is a great way of extending your reach. So mm -hmm. yeah, networks, totally 100% in. <laughs> what is your experience, Ben, Gisette? I, I, I agree with you. I, I think um, mentorship is key, um, especially at an institution like Columbia, you know, um, as a woman and uh, as a diverse, underrepresented woman and having a lab, it's uh, key to have somebody to push you and that's in the room where decisions are made. And so I, when I have a mentee, I always tell them, you know, make sure you choose a good mentor that not only can mentor you and, you know, kind of guide you through, but also sponsor you. So it gives you opportunities to go somewhere where you don't think you can go. Um, and so those opportunities are rare uh, at higher institutions because everyone wants to be the leader. And especially, you know, um, I had an amazing mentor, um, Henry Ginsburg, who, um, you know, I love him to death. Um, he's a career mentor, now a colleague. But, you know, at some point when I got independent and the older I get and the more established I get and the less imposter syndrome I have, I'm like, hmm. Maybe I don't need to do his work anymore. You know, maybe I don't need to be nice. And so, you know, my own personal bias of, you know, they've helped you so much. So you want to be grateful. You want to be, you know, return the favor. And, you know, your book, Kate, put chills up my spine because there's so many stories that I've heard of colleagues that have gotten touched the wrong way or felt the wrong relationship. And, you know, the stories, it's not so easy. Um, 
to talk about, right? Like, how do you know who, who, what, what time do you have to spend so much time with someone that you're going to share this with them? And then the other thing is that, remember, as we're mentoring people that are younger than us, they're going to apply for a job somewhere and they want our reference letter. So they don't want to tell us how vulnerable they are because they think we're going to judge them. And so um, I generally uh, off the bat tell people, um, you know, you can tell me as much as you want, but also realize that I'm a person, right? I have feelings and I make decisions and I need to get my lab working and, you know, I need to produce. <laughs> and so um, I have very open conversations and hence I devoted most of my mentorship to senior people because I feel that that direct, direct mentorship is probably um, less, you're less able to do that with very young people because, you know, they're just vulnerable. Um, so that's the way I do it. Um, we have this program, Aspire, that Sandra spoke about. And I think if it wasn't for that program that started with seven of us peer mentoring each other through a grant award at Columbia through the CTSA, I don't think I would have had such an incline in grants, in salary, in um, understanding what my role was to present at you know different meetings and accepting invitations, not accepting invitations, reviews. And so you know you have so many roles and you're pressure all the time. There's this constant pressure to achieve. And so I think you know Mimi has many peer mentorship groups. I don't think I have many because I don't have time. But but um. I, I I think this group, we're now paying it forward. And so this group now takes a cohort every year of um, from different divisions, which is something that Nancy did very well, right? She found people outside her division to compare. And so I think that that's the beauty of this peer mentorship group, that is people at very different stages and divisions, and they're able to help each other. And um, they're at the same stage. They don't have a dean telling them what they think is best, but they have their peer. So it's kind of cool. Hmm. You know, um, I want to ask you one more question, and then we really will go to the to the audience questions. Um, but I've been, you know, as an anthropologist, that's my background. Uh, I've been rereading um, a lot of the work of Mary Douglas, who's a, a British anthropologist, and she's been she she has written this book about you know how do institutions think, and she's really you know trying to understand how do institutions actually. Uh, create social norms. I mean, yes, you have individuals who are acting in a particular way, but um, it's really at the institutional level that things get really structural and uh, embedded, entrenched uh, in terms of policy and practice. And you know, I I wonder, um, you know, given um, the lawsuit and uh, maybe leadership at different institutions recognizing there's a problem, um, what is it that institutions can do that's going to have the biggest impact in intervening on some of these um, social biases around what women can and cannot do? So I don't, I don't know if you want me to start. Um, yeah, I'm please. interested to hear from people who are actually on faculties because I'm not. But, um, you know, I do think that there are there are small things that they can do, like, you know, the meeting that starts at 430, you know, and doesn't finish until six and, you know, maybe, you know, who's responsible for the child care. I mean, this is something I think is starting to happen already, right? Like, or has maybe has happened a lot of places. Like, so the meeting would end at six and the woman who's in that meeting doesn't want to say, doesn't want to be the one to say, I have to go pick up my kids, right? So is there, can you just change the meeting to early? Like, is it going to hurt? Like, will it hurt the operation of the day or of the institution to move that meeting earlier? So the woman doesn't have to speak up and identify herself as like the one who has kids. Um, Sharon said there have been a lot of changes, daycare, things like that. The hardest part really is this question, of, you know, Chuck Best, who is the president of MIT, who made this incredibly bold statement acknowledging discrimination, said to Nancy, like, I can, anything I can measure, I can fix, right? I can fix salaries. I can fix lab space. I can't fix marginalization because I don't know how to do that, right? So, but, and that is the thing. Someone mentioned this in the chat, in the Q, the Q and A or the chat, um, you know, these, these social, the socializing that happens, right? Like the guys who go out for a beer or the lunchtime basketball game. Um, and nobody wants to be the scold who says like the guys can't all play basketball together at lunch, right? But like, um, 
So I think, you know, one of the things that institutions can do is until you start seeing women applying for women are, we know this from the studies, from the research, women are less likely to apply for jobs, even if they're well qualified. A man with lesser qualifications will put up his hand. So if you don't see women applying for a job, go tap them on the shoulder. It may take a little more of doing that. Um, I would say don't assume, it's very important to provide childcare. There was no daycare at MIT when this whole thing happened, but don't assume that children are the problem or that women, you know, for me in my own career, the big problem has always been like the assumptions about me that somehow after I had kids, I was going to be a different kind of employee that I wouldn't bring the same passion to the job, which is not true. Don't make assumptions about people and what they can do, what they're willing to do after they have children. Um, I think a lot of this is just open dialogue, but also being willing to uh, challenge our, our quick assumptions, right? The, the usual assumptions that we have. I think people have talked in this panel about how, you know, we don't, I think Suzette said this, like the, you know, the people who we expect to see in these roles are not women, not women of color, not people of color. So when, you know, we have to challenge ourselves, like, are we, you know, are we looking at those people differently? Would we be looking at them differently if it were a white man speaking? Um, so I guess, I, I mean, I have many thoughts on this, but I, I wanna hear others as well. Yeah, no, that's great. That's a good start. Um, Mimi, yeah. yeah. No, I totally agree. Um, I was just thinking of an example Talk, just even talking about the issues, right, is is great. Um, but when Gisette was talking about, um, you know, the different words that are used to describe men versus women, for example, right? Um, I It really made me think about this. I wrote a letter of recommendation for one of my students and a senior female faculty member actually said, you know, I want to talk to you about this letter. So you use the word brilliant. Is that the right word or you want to say really smart? And then... What about um, uh, persistent instead of determined? Or, you know, she wanted to like change my the language of my letter. And it made me really realize like, ho holy cow, like <laughs> this is, that that's the way that people want to describe women versus men. And I just, it be, um, you know, I think that that's something that I think we don't think about. Um, mm -hmm. Oftentimes, we're also when we're reading letters, for example, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, just being aware of that really early in my career, like made me realize, okay, so this is something that we can change, right? That's really easy and really tangible. And, but something that I didn't, ne wouldn't necessarily have thought of on my own, right? So I think talking about things and sort of putting light on the issue and just saying, you know, there are all these subconscious things that are happening um, and we should just be aware of it and think, is that really, do I, do I mean brilliant? Yeah, actually I do, I do mean brilliant. <laughs> She's a brilliant student. <laughs> and so, you know, I, we had this discussion. I don't know if I changed her mind, um, but, you know, I think just talking about it made a, made a difference, hopefully. That's so interesting. So Mimi, it makes me wonder, you know, given that evidence does count for some things, um, is there a project in there where we should be looking at promotion letters and blinding it for, um, you know, gender and sex and, and just reading what the what the adjectives are and to see yeah. how they they play out? I mean, wouldn't that be interesting? I, do. <laughs> I think, yeah. I think yeah. there might be some research into that. There already. is. Yeah. yeah. And there's also research, there's wonderful research that shows um, that men and women alike, right? I don't want to, I don't want to make it sound like we're having a discussion about how bad men are, right? This is cultural. We're all doing this. Men and women alike are much more likely to use the word genius to apply to men, right? And they also are more likely to think that science, this is why science is such an interesting field in which to study these biases. They assume that science requires some kind of brilliance, particularly when you're talking about pure math or theoretical physics, because they involve a lot of numbers. Um, and so the effect of that is that women think like, oh, I'm not a genius. I can't go into science because that requires genius. So there's like it affects the self-selection as well. Mm -hmm. I always tell the story about you can tell a little bit from a clip of Sharon's film um, that Nancy has this slight British accent, which although she grew up in New York City, not far from Columbia, um, she had an English grandmother who lived near her. And when I first started talking to her, pretty much every day in 2018, um, I noticed that she kept using the word brilliant. And I was like, oh, is that the thing that British people do? Like where, you know, the tea is brilliant, the scone is brilliant. And I, so I asked her about it and she said, oh, no, no, no. It's just that I noticed that people kept describing the men as brilliant and nobody ever used that word to apply to women. So I decided that I was going to do it. And I was just going to call the women brilliant. And I was like, 
that's brilliant, right? <laughs> Oh, she's, she's, she's very, uh, a good observer. Yeah. That's <laughs> Gisette. Um, I guess, you know, going back to your question of, you know, what's next, right? Like, what do we do? And, and, you know, we're living in a very tough time, right? Because, um, there's many things going on and, uh, and, you know, I, I always equate this to when I came to Columbia, um, you know, I'm from the Dominican Republic and usually, you know, Dominicans travel in packs and we like each other. We like to hang out. And and so I didn't have that pack. You know, there's no one else that's from the Dominican Republic with a lab at Columbia. I am the sole person, male or female. And so we're not having merengue or, you know, food parties <laughs> at, um, at, at the lab. And so I think that people generally tend, and research has been done on this, tend to gravitate to things that they have in similar. And so I think the university, um, you know, is trying to do this, which is to bind people by other things that are not race and, you know, um, where you went to school or, you know, so, you know, sort of bringing state type of events where we talk about what other things can be binding you, you know, if we have the same science or if we have the same methods or, um, you know, there has to be other ways of us networking and building our networks. And so my networks and the way that I was able, and you saw through my foundation work, I had to go outside of Columbia to find people that actually um, would help me to feel the way that I wanted to feel because no one, the structure that is here right now doesn't fit what I want to do. Because everyone who's, um, you know, looks like me does like epi research and it's interested in health disparities and I'm interested in lipoproteins. I want to learn more basic science. I want to know how EVs are being secreted and, you know, people that look like me don't do that. So I think that, you know, they're starting early. So we have high school programs in the summer and we bring them in really early. They see us, they see me, we talk. Um, last Saturday, I spent, you know, an hour and a half over lunch doing a Zoom with high school students from our neighborhoods. I think the more they see us, the more we talk to them. I also, you know, I wanna bring up something that was mentioned in the chat, where it's like, you know, women to women, you know, that feistiness of us. Um, I have begun to call it out. So, you know, I have said at meetings, I am not here to judge another woman's character or her decisions. Let's just move on beyond that. Let's deal with the problem. And, you know, not that she's, a, you know, what Mimi said, people call her, um, but was the decision made? Is it a good decision? Is it a bad decision? So try to take away the stigma of what it means to make a decision by a woman. So I, I've been in plenty of meetings, you know, Aspire is seven women, so there, there has, you know, even though we're peer to peer and we're helping each other, there has been times when we need to make decisions and we're very, try to be very sec asexual about the decisions that we make. And so that's one thing. And then I, I worry because if all these DEI efforts and all these um, mandatory things that have been put in place that in some ways have helped people um, advance, I worry that the pipeline is not gonna be there. And from writing a training grant two years ago, I can tell you that I looked at the statistics of underrepresented women that were staying in science and coming to us and it was so low. And so the numbers, where are we gonna recruit from? You know, and New York is expensive. Uh, you know, we just don't have the resources to support them. So I, you know, I worry a lot about what the pipeline is going to look like in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that you bring up and and one of our um, audience members uh, also brings up um, just the, the, the kind of uh, attack on DEI now um, and that many programs are being eliminated and what will this mean in terms of whatever progress was occurring with women in particular in science with the pathways programs potentially being um, eliminated um, what can we what what does the future um, have for us in terms of 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 trying to promote um, the progress that uh, I think has been experienced over the last decade or so um, Any thoughts on that? I mean, I do think that um, if you look at some of the newer research, there is great interest in one of the things that's improved is there is great interest in hiring women at the assistant and associate level, right? So there is, I think, 
the, there's enough awareness about the issue that things have changed. Mm -hmm. The problem still is what, how, how do you treat those women over the years? Like how, you know, do those women end up feeling like they don't belong? Um, they're spoken over in meetings. They're not listened to. They're discounted. They're not given credit for our, our, their ideas. All the same problems that have been there for so long. Um, I think so. So I think if you can, I think there is still an interest in getting people in the door. Um, I think we just, as I, it sounds so simple, but I think it really is true. Like we just need to keep talking about this and reminding ourselves of all the different, we're talking about all the different nuanced ways that people do get pushed aside and do get pushed out of science ultimately. Yeah, and the loss to science, right? I mean, yes, it, we're losing people, but those people are are important in terms of um, the quality of the science. I mean, the research suggests that um, it's absolutely true. Um, I'm looking at Angela Towns um, question here and um, let's see here, was it Angela or was it, oh, it keeps disappearing the questions. Um, uh, I think it was, oh, sorry, Susan Steinberg. Um, you know, she she says that she's an MIT grad and she's she's questioning um, Nancy Hopkins as being the messenger here and, and speaking uh, specifically to what I, you know, what you actually, Kate, um, really discuss well, this kind of trope around uh, losing women to motherhood, um, which was a, a theme. And, you know, we think about that. Is that, is that still a theme uh, in science? I mean, you yeah, alluded so to I saw Susan's question and I did want to answer it. So, and Susan says, you know, she views Nancy as kind of a flawed messenger for this because Nancy has said, like, she thinks science is incompatible with ha having a career in science is incompatible with having children. So just to be clear, this is one of the, Nancy no longer believes this. She thinks that now there have been so many changes. Like we do, you know, we have daycare and you can, it's it, at the time these women came together, again, 1994, not dark ages, no woman had taken maternity leave because there was such a stigma around it. You were, it was just like, you won't get tenure if, if you do this. Men were taking it, women were not. But, and, and so this is something that's, that I find really that I found really interesting in reporting the book was, was trying to piece together like when, you know, Nancy starts out as not a feminist, not an activist. What happened to her over that 20 years between when she starts at MIT and she comes together with this group of women to change her mind? And so in 1976, which is early in her days, she does write this piece in the Radcliffe Quarterly where she says, you know, you can't have, you can't do this job and have a family life. Like that's just her, you know, blanket statement. She really did believe that that was the problem for women. And one of the great revelations of this MIT report was that, in fact, it wasn't. It is not children who are holding women back. Children are an issue, certainly, and we need we should make um, adjustments to to you know so that people, men and women alike, can have careers and integrate that with their family life. Um, but Nancy believed that science was a meritocracy. It didn't, you know, it was. Just, it, but if you had kids, it would pull you away. When you look at this group of 16 women at MIT who came forward and said this, half of them didn't have children. They were incredibly accomplished. So you looked at this group and you couldn't say, well, the reason they feel discriminated against is because they have children and they really don't want to work as hard. Like that, it, they really gave the lie to that idea. So I think it's important, but I do want to be clear, like this is something that has changed. This is a great sign of progress. It's not easy to have kids and have a career in science, but it can be done. And I think even Nancy does believe that. Mm-hmm. And this brings me back to this question about institutional practice and policy. I mean, certain things have developed over time that um, hopefully uh, is mitigating this kind of motherhood tax, if you will, um, that that really penalizes women uh, right at the time. I mean, there's a convergence, right, when they're supposed to be most productive. Mimi, you alluded to this. I'm wondering if there are other policies and practices that the institution can adapt um, as a way of trying to mitigate uh, that bias when somebody's thinking about hiring someone and but they look like they're they just got married perhaps and and they may be lost for a few years because they are going to end up um, rearing children, um, not having that be such an important calculus for some people when they're making these kinds of investments in people in their labs or on their faculty. I have a suggestion. I think yeah. the university should pay for um, maternity leave um, because for students in particular, but mm -hmm. also because mm -hmm. when I was a postdoc, I mean, it makes a big difference in your relationship with your boss, right? If they are paying for you to have children um, and that is just a formula for resentment, right? Um, because money is tight and they need 
people to be active and working and committed to science and all of this stuff, right? But if you remove the financial component, then most scientists would be very supportive of somebody having um, children. So when I was in, when I was a postdoc, I had two, two babies um, and I was in California and in the state of California, as soon as you are employed, um, you be, you buy into their family leave act um, and your maternity leave gets paid for by the state of California or insurance companies, basically. Um, and then there isn't as much of an issue um, in terms of, you know, uh, my my relationship with my boss. Um, you know, there's still all kinds of other issues. Like, you know, I, I don't remember my postdoc, most of my postdoc, because I was like, you know, breastfeeding or pregnant, like more than 50% of the time. But that was, you know, I was able to, I feel very lucky. I had that choice and I had that opportunity because, you know, um, uh, and and did not ruin my relationship with my postdoc advisor. So somebody's listening at Columbia University, like we could do that. You know, there there should be money for set aside for women who want to have babies. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Yeah, Gisette, you wanted to say something. I I, I concur. You know, so I I have a friend. Sorry, Jimmy and I have a friend in common, and she just had a baby. Um, she had her two kids now after becoming a professor. And so I had my kids as soon as I got my faculty position, um, two back to back. And so 15, uh, 15 and 14 now. And so, um, so, you know, you can see the progression of careers. It's not a joke. It's, you know, it's just, it consumes you. And I think money helps, but I don't think money is the answer because I also think, you know, so they are policies, right? We get longer time on te to tenure track because of the kids. Um, now there's money for traveling to meetings. Now there's money that you can pay someone in your house. Um, but I think it just, it, the programs are not easy to use and people don't know about them. And so I think like creating a package for a postdoc to come with sort of like a faculty comes, right? A faculty comes and say, oh, your kids are gonna go to the Columbia school and we're gonna pay for it and parking is here and these are your benefits. And so if you hire a postdoc and you have that, I just don't know where that money is gonna come from, right? Because we're already stressed with research money. And so, but there has to be that investment where you say, and it's not only for women, you know, we forget about the men, right? Men wanna have families and their wives want to work. And so it may be that the package is for the men to have kids because they also want to be with their kids. I think we forget that the new generation of dads wants to spend time with their children. Um, they want to be home. They're like, well, how long are you taking off? Because I want to go home too. <laughs> like, you know, like, so I, I think that the conversation is, is, is a little bit more broad, but I agree with Mimi that um, creating policies that um, encourage people to want to work, to have secure housing, um, it's really hard for you know, someone, I recruitment of people to do science, like on a scientific track. You know, clinicians don't want to stay in science. You know, I have a fellow now who's a vascular surgeon, and she's seen me for two years taking a break um, during residency, and she's like, "Well, how am I going to do this and also operate? And then when am I going to have kids? You know, and she's in her thirties, and and how am I going to make money? And how are we going to live? And you know, is that everything going to be my husband? And and you know, she she did get married now, but it, it's not such an easy conversation. And the worst part is that no um, no policy is one fits all because we're all so different, <laughs> and we all start at different stages. So I think it's challenging for sure. But agree with maybe more money always solves the problem, like, you know, having your kids in a good school or being taken care of by the right person. Um, it's really nice. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, you know, I wanted to go back to one of the questions earlier. Um, I think it was Emily Kribas, who um, is really trying to um, highlight the power of storytelling. Um, and this comes out very beautifully in both Kate and Sharon's work. Um, and I'm just wondering, um, you know, is that, are you finding that the ability to tell these stories and women sharing their stories with others um, might be more powerful than, <laughs> than the actual facts in terms of changing uh, minds and also changing behavior? 
Um, I think it was that, you know, so so this report, um, the MIT report was, as I said, it was it, it resonated because of the tape measure, right? The idea it had data. But mm -hmm. there was an immediate immediate backlash where people said, oh, this is junk science because there's such a small number of women that these number, this is not a real control group. This is not a, a representative sample. It can't be. There are too many numbers, small numbers. And as an economist, and professor said to me, university professor at one of the Ivy League schools said to me recently, that's always the problem with women. Like we want to talk about that there are such small numbers that we can't make our case. So yes, it really was. It's not just the data. It was the data and the stories that changed people's um, changed people's perceptions. The reason that Chuck Vest, the president of MIT, decided to talk about this was when he first looked at the data, he was like, well, the junior faculty, the women as junior faculty, they seem happy. And then one of the senior faculty, who was really one of the most accomplished women at, at MIT, who he really wanted to keep, said, well, I, I felt the same way as a junior faculty member. And it was like, oh, like, so it really, it's, are there these epiphany moments? Um, I would also say just as a reporter now covering abortion, we're seeing this with abortion as well. If you look at the polls, there is more public um, support for abortion, for a, a right to abortion. Um, which is, and that, that number has actually been pretty stagnant for decades. What has changed it, if again, this pollsters have shown this, what's changed it is that more people are hearing stories about in particular women who need abortions and are being denied them, even though there's like, some medical emergency, right? So they're understanding the nuances of the issue. So the same thing happens, I think, with women in science or with, with the idea of marginalization. The more we tell our stories, the more people start saying, oh, that's how it happens. I mean, I just, yes, I'm always, a, I'm, this is what I've devoted my life to, my career to, is just telling people stories and trying to put them with data to kind of hold up a mirror to ourselves. Yeah, similarly, I mean, with the with the film, I, I think I wrote in the comment, um, we obviously, I, I'm a storyteller, I really believe strongly in the power of personal stories. Um, and I do think, I mean, even now, like if you look in the politics and like really every everywhere, stories are the thing that move culture along and, and can take us back too. Um, so it's something that that I thought we thought a lot about with the film is like, what's the balance of the data to the stories? And we really tried, like we had a long cut. I, we saw so many rough cuts, obviously, of this film, um, but there was a really long one that was like two and a half hours long. And it was very much like many studies, you know, lots of data. Um, kind of paired with the, the stories and it was about 50 50 and we just were like oh my god you know I don't know if this is right and so it took a lot of finessing to get to the point where we decided to land which I think was more like 30 70. Um, I, I mean that's not a scientific number but that's kind of how it felt to us in the edit um, yeah but it, it is it's the pairing of both that really makes it like, you know, even if there's just a little bit, like if it feels like a good balance, um, I think it can be very powerful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and I imagine that the, the craft of storytelling, I mean, um, the reader or the viewer needs to see themselves in some way in the story and, and the kind of the representation of different lived experience becomes so important, I imagine, so that different people can really understand and see themselves in these stories. Is that fair to say or? Yeah, I mean, I think that I think what you're talking about is is really compassion and that, yes, we like that's definitely true. This is like anything or, or empathy, right? We talk a lot about empathy, but what does it actually mean? And I think that's it, being able to hear someone's story and think like, okay, maybe it doesn't 100% match up, but I can see something of myself in your story. I can see your perspective. Mm -hmm. And the courage. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Mimi. Yes. I was just going to say, that's also the way to, to ch enact change because I think people don't, you know, everybody everybody think wants to think of themselves as not being biased, right? I mean, nobody, nobody, nobody is like, well, not nobody, but like a, most people are not intentionally biased and most people do not want to intentionally marginalize anyone. But, you know, you hear a story and you're like, oh, that kind of thing. I can see how that would happen without any malintent, but how that would might make somebody feel like they're being marginalized. Right. And I, th I think that's just a, a way to make it real and concrete so that people can change their own behavior so that, you know, they, they won't do it anymore. <laughs> but I think, you know, when you present it as like a, a principle, everybody's in on that. You know, everybody's like doubles down and says, I'm not like that. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm 
terrific to women. (laughs) You know what I mean? And most people are, right? But it's just like opening their minds to sort of things that they might not consider or see, right? You have to tell a story to make it real. Mm -hmm. I will say also with with the movie, just a little tidbit from behind the scenes is that we, um, even while we were making the film, we had a hard time finding people who were willing to share their stories. Um, you know, outside of MIT and, and the story of the MIT 16, 16, um, I think originally, yeah, like, uh, it was hard to find people who wanted to share and they would tell us off the record and then they'd be like, oh, no, I don't want to be in the film, you know, so that was, you know, happens all the time and, and you can't force, it was obviously like, yeah, you know, it's, it's easy for me to say, sure, share your stories, like I'm a storyteller, I want to tell your story, but, um, but if you don't want to, or if you feel like there's a reason why you need to not share it until you're a tenured faculty, it's completely understandable. And I think one of the reasons that people don't want to share their stories are the scientists, the women that I talked to in reporting the book, not to, again, not just the MIT women, but other women, is that they really do feel like there is this assumption in science or in, in medicine as well, that it really just is about the work. Like there's a purity to it, right? Like the whole, you know, you know I went to you know, one university, um, they talked about wearing white as a symbol of like how pure science is, right? And um, so for their for their big annual like convocations and things, they all wear white. And um, and I think so. There is this idea that like if you t- if you talk about discrimination, it's it's really it's a problem with your work. It's not it's not really a thing. This is objective. It's not subjective. Like it's just that you're not. So I think these women don't want to make them. There are two things. One, I think they don't want to. Um, they don't want to raise their hand because they think like they'll look like they're making excuses. That's one thing. And the second thing is that so many women talk to me um, about they just worry that if they started to think about these things and what might be discrimination and is that discrimination, like it takes time to do that and it can throw you off track. You want to put all of your time into doing your science, into doing your job. So you don't want to get distracted by the idea of like, oh, is that discrimination? So the, the only thing you can do is just keep pushing ahead. So mm-hmm. yeah, I think that it, it is hard to get people to tell their stories for that reason, to go public. Yes. Yeah, especially I, I would imagine um, when there's no al- option. I mean, if you were to admit you're in a context or an environment where there's rampant bias, but how do you, what's what's the other option for you? To go to another university where there's also bias. So um, it's very hard to confront these things if there's not a really... And again, that's that's where science is is different and is an interesting case study for this, because like in science, the work takes so long. Right. It's not like you can just like I could, you know, get up and go work at some other organization and write write my stories there. I don't have like a, you know, a five year commitment where I've done. I've been working in a lab for five years and I'm at year seven. I might get my Ph.D. Like, you know, it's, it's much harder to walk away from that that experience. Yes, absolutely. And the relationships that are built yes. within the scientific community. Yeah, right. absolutely. Yeah. Um, I want to take a moment to just ask the panelists if you have questions for each other, because I know I've been kind of directing questions to each of you, but if you, I want to give you a chance to ask each other any questions that you might have, um, given your different vantage points to this topic. I have a question, but I just want to say that, like, I... You know, I saw Sharon's movie, I think probably at the same time that Mimi did during COVID. And it's not something that I would have watched if you, <laughs> if it wasn't because of COVID, because, you know, it's hard, right? And so, and then I listened to the book, the whole book. Um, and, you know, I was neglected to read the book because I just don't want those, you know, once you read it, you also start thinking, oh my God these things are still happening. How can it still be happening if in 1960s, you know, if there's been so much growth and there's so much acknowledgement of this, why is this structural division still there? Um, but I'll stop there because I think there's some really good stuff going on in the chat. <laughs> that I've been oh, yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I think there was some um, comments that women should have babies earlier that, you know, Um, I think, you know, I will just give my opinion about um, how I felt about having a family. So I come from a family that is an immigrant to the U.S. and we have four siblings and my parents, I did not grow up poor. We went bankrupt uh, and then immigrated to this country. And we have quite an amazing story of um, 
resilience and just growth and, you know, um, coming to this country and being given the opportunity um, as professionals, my parents were. And so I, ch having children was never a question in me of whether I was going to have them or not, or whether I needed a career or not. And so I think having children should be a decision of your beliefs in family and not, and, you know, and I have really separated that lately. Um, and, you know, I'm going to be in my fifties now. And I, I really like parsed out, this is my academic family. This is my home family. And so I think if you put them all together, it gets messy. And so I think that you can give yourself the space. And I tell fellows this way, this is my way, just that's way. There's other ways people, you know, do it with the nanny at home and she wakes up at six and takes care of the kids. I didn't want to do it that way. I wanted to be a mom. I rush home every day to cook for my children. I wake up every day at 5.30 so they can have a warm breakfast. That's my style. And I think you have to make that decision. Yes, I am. haven't had a nature paper yet, <laughs> but it's coming because they're going to leave. <laughs> and then I'm going to have, you know, the rest of my years to continue to do the work that I want to do and the science that I want to do. And so that is, you know, there are options for people that want to do both. So I don't think, you know, extremes of, you know, thinking about an extremes. I think you have to really know yourself and your needs as a person, because you cannot go through life being frustrated if you find the right man <laughs> that um that you're not going to have a child or you know so anyway that's my thought on that okay good um well we're almost out of time and I do want to give each of you just some you know one last moment to to tell um Tell us what you think should be kind of the next step in terms of um, making progress in this in this space. Like, what's what's something that you would leave us with in terms of um, a next step? Well, I do like to talk about um, changing. You know, doing a little bit of thought thought experiment with yourself. And if you watch Sharon's uh, film, you'll see Mazarin Banaji, the woman we saw in the clip, who's this, who really is one of the pioneers of this idea of unconscious bias. She gives people a test to like, right? And so, what Mazarin and what we what she finds and what the research has found is that people are just slower to associate maybe science or intellect or careers or intelligence with women. So I always say to people like, just when you're when you're listening to someone talk, right? When you're listening to a politician or listening to your doctor or whoever it is, like, think to yourself, do the little thought experiment. Like, would I be, would I be hearing this information differently if it came from a woman or a man? Like, how is gender affecting this? And you don't have to be punishing about it or, you know, scolding, but just kind of like, allow yourself to be a little bit curious about the bias. I think as, you know, we talked about compassion earlier, empathy, I think compassion and curiosity are really, really important steps as we go forward. Mm-hmm. I love that. Um, yeah, I think uh, what we were talking about earlier really resonates with me um, with the resumes and or kind of how you describe yourself and, and that study that Corinne Masrakusen does in the film um, about the two resumes with the, you know, different names, same resume. Um, I think about that a lot ever since we filmed this movie. I think about it all the time and I think about what words I use to describe people and um, and I think I would just challenge everybody to use the word brilliant more and to you know to to really think about how you're when you're writing somebody a letter of recommendation or when you're putting yourself forward for something like how do you want to present yourself and try to um i don't know just try to challenge what you might normally write or what, what you might feel more comfortable writing or I, I do it a lot with like trying to be a little more assertive than maybe i'm comfortable you know i feel i have imposter syndrome just like everybody else and so i'm kind of like okay i'm gonna be pushier and you know um, anyway, that's, yeah, one little thing you can try. Okay, great. Mimi? Mm, I would say um, talking to each other with respect, regardless of who the person is. Do you know what I mean? Like, I can say for me, like being very small, I'm very short. I'm like four foot seven and a half <laughs> inches tall. And um uh, is that, you know, a lot of times, at least before I had all this gray hair, um, people would assume that I was young um, because of my height. And so I could see how people treated people that they thought were below them, right? And and 
it's a little window into like, you know, if we want to make things better, we just make things better for everybody. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, we're talking about women here or people of color, but like everybody, right? Like, you know, students and also, you know, um, women faculty or whatever, you know, there, a lot of it is is respect, right? Um, women may feel like they're not being respected or trusted um, because of what they look like, as opposed to, you know, what they're saying. You know, they there was somebody in the chat who talked about, um, you know, saying that it's not assumed that she has a body of knowledge equivalent to other people's. Um, so when she asks a question or professes to being, you know, not knowing something, then it, that's taken as a much larger statement about her than anyone else. So, you know, just, just being mindful of our assumptions about other people and and speaking to people with respect, you know, and just just understanding, like, you know, we're we're all um, we're all we're all contributing um, in different ways, and and you know, there's no there's no cost actually <laughs> to like talking, talking to each other with respect. I mean, there's a very cheap and easy way to um, to give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, I think is would be another way to put it. Mm -hmm. Josette. I think I said a lot. Um, I, I would say the one thing we haven't talked about is about loving yourself. And so, and I think that applies to a lot of the things that we struggle with as women and especially Women's History Month. Um, love your good, love your bad, admit when you there's parts of you that you're not gonna love so much. And I think that I always tell people this, they are going through a tough time. It's like my go-to sentence because I don't know what to say most of the time. And I said, you know, you can't love others until you love yourself. And so you can't do good until you do good to you. And so I think that if you practice good on you first, then it's easier to be good to others because you know what feels good. And so that would be my, you know, my take home message that, you know, Try to think of like, how do you want to be treated? And then that's how I found my happy place. <laughs> that's great. Thank you. That's wonderful. Well, we are we are out of time. I, I really want to thank all four of our panelists today um, for their for sharing so much and for the for the brilliant works by Kate and um Sharon. Uh, honestly, if you have not read the book or you haven't seen the film, you must um, do so. It's it's well worth it. Um, and I also wanna thank uh, the Teams resource at the Irving Institute for Clinical Tr and Translational Research in the Division of Ethics, uh, Bioethics, uh, Bioethics and Film uh, Organizing Committee for their support in planning the event. Uh, thank you audience for your many questions. Um, and I wanted to also invite you um, for our next Division of Ethics event on April 19th, which is our Ethics Grand Rounds, uh, where our panel of experts will discuss challenges and solutions concerning climate change and associated health risks. Uh, you can subscribe to our mailing list to stay up to date with uh, the details of this event as well as others. Uh, the links should be in the chat. And then finally, you will see a post-event survey pop up when this webinar ends. And I, I really encourage you to complete it. We take your comments very seriously. Um, they have been very helpful in terms of uh, us uh, developing our various series and bringing new topics and speakers to you. So please do fill it out. Uh, but again, thank you to everyone. Um, this was a terrific conversation. We're also very grateful. Take care. <laughs>